In this episode, I'm going to experiment with multimode fiber in a DIY super continuum laser. The beams are four times brighter and exhibit some really weird nonlinear effects. So let's go. In a previous episode, I'd replicated work from an academic paper written in 1975 by Chinlong Lin and R.H. Stolen. In this paper, they pumped a silica fiber cable with a small dye laser and actually managed to generate a super continuum output. When I replicated this process, I used 200 meters of 9 micron telecoms cable, which is ridiculously cheap, and produced a super continuum that stretched all the way from 430 nanometers all the way up to 670 nanometers, almost the entire visible spectrum, which was absolutely spectacular to see. To improve coupling and throughput, multimode 50 micron telecoms cable can actually be used, and I succeeded in doing this in December. Um, this was going to be the second half of the last video, uh, but unfortunately during the filming I actually managed to blow the facets off the end of the fiber because of the high peak powers involved. Since that episode I've bought a fiber cleaver and I've re-cleaved the ends of the fiber so I can actually demonstrate this for you guys today. Multimode fiber it turns out is actually fantastic at producing super continuum. At visible wavelengths, I suppose all fiber is actually multimode, and in fact, one or two of you guys had put in the comments from the previous video that really at visible wavelengths, uh, nine micron cable is in fact multimode, and this is true. But 50 micron cable, we can get exceptional coupling. We can get full coupling, essentially. Um, I suppose it would be the equivalent of, um, of trying to throw a tennis ball down a, a drain pipe and trying to, uh, with nine micron cable and trying to throw tennis balls down a sewer pipe uh, with 50 micron cable. Um, the results, as we'll see shortly, are both spectacular and also super weird as well. Some very, very unusual stuff happens with multimode cable that you totally wouldn't expect to see. Before we get into all of this, though, let's talk about power. Uh, power is the reason why this video took so long to get off the ground, because I was destroying the ends of my fiber. So before we get started, I want to measure the output power of the dye laser itself. And once we get super continuum out of this length of multimode cable, I'd be actually curious to see how much power we're actually getting coupled in and out of the fiber as well. So let's take a look at that. In order to measure pulsed lasers like this, we actually need two sensors to do the job. Uh, the first is a joule meter. Um, this doesn't measure in the time domain at all. It just measures joules, that's it. Um, so the idea is, is we mount the sensor in this beam path and we actually read off a signal uh, using an oscilloscope. Uh, the signal, as I've said before, isn't, uh, it doesn't measure in the time domain. And in fact, when we come to see it on the scope, we'll see that we'll actually be using a relatively slow time base of about two milliseconds per division. Uh, what actually happens with these is when uh, light impinges on the surface of the sensor, it generates a tiny amount of heat. This is picked up by a pyroelectric sensor and the little output pulse that we get, we can just simply measure the height of the pulse and that gives us uh, how many microjoules or millijoules we happen to be seeing at the time. To get an idea of the actual peak power per pulse in kilowatts, we also need to measure in the time domain. And for this, we need a silicon photodiode. This is a special photodiode that I picked up from Thor Labs. Uh, this is an FDS-015. Uh, this actually has a 35 picosecond rise time. Uh, so it's an exceptionally fast photodiode and we should be able to measure the pulse width of the laser with this as well. Um, for this, I'm actually using a new oscilloscope that I've picked up. I say new in inverted commas. It's, a, it's an old Tektronix uh, 500 megahertz oscilloscope, uh, which should be just fast enough to measure the uh, pulse width of our dye laser. So I have the dye laser set up here, lasing Kumar in one, and the beam is being directed by a mirror all the way across the end of the bench there to my sensor. Let's take a look at the oscilloscope. If we take a look at the output on the oscilloscope there, um, we can see our peak. Uh, remember that this isn't actually measuring in the time domain at all. We completely ignore the time. We're just interested in the height of the peak. So we take the height of the peak, which is about 2.8 millivolts, and divide it by the sensitivity of the sensor. Um, at 134.3 volts per joule, uh, this comes out with an energy of 20.85 microjoules or 21 microjoules if we want to round it. So now we're measuring the pulse width of the dye laser. I have my silicon photodiode mounted at the back here, but in front of it, I've got a ground glass plate so that we're not exposing the actual tiny photodiode itself to this really quite high powered beam. Let's take a look and see what this looks like on the oscilloscope. 
This is the output from the photodiode shown on the oscilloscope here. This is a TDS754C, uh, 500 megahertz oscilloscope with two gig samples per second. I think we're almost right at the very bottom end of the range that this oscilloscope is capable of measuring. In fact, uh, this scope is a candidate for being hacked uh, up to one gigahertz bandwidth, but that's for a future episode. Uh, all that aside, uh, we've got a nice pulse here with a pulse width of about 1.8, 1.9 nanoseconds, which is exactly what we'd expect given that the uh, nitrogen laser, it says, is under 2.4 nanoseconds. So now that we've got our sensor data, we can enter it into this handy calculator that I wrote some time ago. Uh, we've already got our sensitivity of the pyroelectric sensor in volts per joule, so 134.3 volts per joule. We'll put in 2.8 millivolts, which is what we read on the oscilloscope. Um, the pulse width we've measured at approximately 1.9 nanoseconds and the repetition rate is 32. We'll hit calculate and we can see our calculated pulse energy 20.85 microjoules. Uh, peak power uh, almost 11 kilowatts and our average power at that repetition rate is about 0.67 milliwatts which is about what I'd expect. So I'm on Ophir Optics website here and they have a handy little calculator that can calculate uh, power density quite easily without having to you know, crack out the calculator. And so once again, we can just feed our values in. So our beam diameter here I've set at 50 microns because that's gonna be the diameter of the core that we're coupling into. Um, this is all gonna assume 100% coupling efficiency. Um, the maximum energy is 20.85 microjoules, which, which I've measured with the pyroelectric sensor and a pulse width of 1.9 nanoseconds, which I've measured with the fast photodiode. And we can see that we're coming out with a peak power, once again, of 11 kilowatts. But check out the power density um, at the end of the fiber in uh, watts per square centimeter. Um, we're at 1.1 gigawatts per square centimeter, which, uh, funnily enough, matches almost exactly the figure described in Lynn and Stolen's original 1975 paper. Um, and this would explain why it is that it's so easy to actually uh, you know, blow off the ends of the fiber. When we, if we've got a power density like that, um, yeah, we could, we could exceed the damage threshold of glass quite easily. Um, moreover, if we've got any particulate matter on the end of the fiber whatsoever, dust and smoke or whatever else have you, um, obviously that's going to absorb quite a significant portion um, of, that, uh, of that beam there and uh, contribute to thermal effects at the end of the fiber. Uh, so yeah, cool stuff. So what we want to see today is some super continuum generation with uh, multimode fiber. This is just 25 meters of uh, multimode fiber. This is 50 micron telecoms fiber. Uh, this is actually the one that I damaged. And on the end here, we'll be able to see or not see um, in, in this particular case, the ferrule, um, because I've had to cut off the original fiber end, strip back the fiber and cleave it. I'll see if I can get a close up shot of the end of the fiber for you. So here's a close-up of the end of the fiber. We can see that I've stripped back the jacket, uh, cleaned off the actual fiber itself, and then cleaved it right at the tip there. So we just have a, a bare fiber flapping around in the breeze. Um, I've actually mounted this with a piece of Kapton tape to a mounting block, just so that it's stable and it doesn't fall off and cause me any problems. Uh, but yeah, there it is, uh, a raw fiber. So here's the raw end of my fiber. Uh, mounted on a small mount and positioned some eight centimeters away from a target. Before I actually power up the super continuum laser, I want to show you what I originally expected to see, because uh, we see something really quite special happen. This is a, a fiber optic fault locator and I've mounted on a short stub, a 50 micron uh, fiber, which I've freshly cleaved. And if I pointed at this target, at a distance of about eight centimeters, we end up with a spot that's about 30 millimeters in diameter or three centimeters. And that is exactly what we'd expect, right? If we've got a raw fiber with no collimator on the end, we would expect that the light would diverge in, a, in quite a large cone and we'd end up with quite a large spot. And um, when we power up the super continuum laser, we'll see something really interesting. Now this is beating with the camera in some inexplicable way, no doubt, because it's a pulse laser. But look at this, uh, same conditions as before, where the tip of the fiber is some eight centimeters away from the target. But now we've got a spot that's more like nine millimeters in diameter. Um, really, really peculiar indeed. In fact, if you recall from the previous video, what we actually had out of nine micron cable was a very large 30 millimeter diameter spot um, that was actually donut shaped. Um, this looks like a pure Gaussian spot. Absolutely fascinating. I'm actually, I've actually been having a, a couple of conversations with, uh, with some uh, scientists in the field of nonlinear optics to try and figure out or to, you know, to try and find out why is it doing this? Um, I have no concrete answer at this point. 
Um, I have been pointed to a couple of academic papers and it, it appears for the moment, um, and you know, hashtag more research required, right? But it appears for the moment that what's actually happening here uh, is a phenomenon called uh, self mold cleaning, where we're feeding in a rather dirty beam and as it's traveling down the fiber, um, the peak powers are so high that uh, nonlinear effects take over and it's actually cleaning up the mold of the beam and where it's, you know, it's, it's essentially guiding itself down the center of the core, um, which is really fascinating. Um, once again, I've got a lot more research to do on this to try and really nail this phenomenon down. Uh, but yes, very, very cool indeed. If I remove the attenuators, we'll end up with a much brighter spot. Uh, I don't know how white this will appear on camera, but it certainly appears uh, quite white to my eye. Um, but yeah, we've still got this very, very pure beam emerging from the end there. So I'm just going to walk you through this setup real quick. Right in front of the end of the bare fiber over here, I've mounted a collimating lens. It's just a simple lens uh, that collimates our beam. That's then bounced off of a mirror over here into a flint glass dispersing prism. It's bounced off a secondary mirror over this side and then projected onto our target. Uh, currently the system is idling and we can see we've actually got quite a broad continuum coming out of the end of the fiber. Uh, once I remove the attenuators, uh, you know, this is going to be quite bright. I'm actually working in room light at the moment. And what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to stop down the camera because with the aperture this wide open, um, we will never see the beautiful colors that we get out of this. So there we are stopped down I and mean, you should be able to clearly see now on the camera that we're going all the way from blue through to just about into the green and we'll start to remove the attenuators. And there's our continuum. We'll just remove the last one. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, once again, I am in full room lighting here. This is gorgeous. I'm just panning around the bench for you guys. We can see very, very clearly we've got the most superb needle sharp beam emerging uh, from the end of the collimator there. That is absolutely fantastic. It's rare to see a beam of that quality, except from the likes of gas lasers. You can see a secondary reflection coming off the edge of the prism there. Beautiful. Absolutely spectacular. Very, very nice. Because everyone loves laser beams, I've got the beam bouncing off of a diffraction grating over here. And once I remove the attenuators and crank this up to full power, um, we'll be able to see a beautiful view of our spectrum through fog. Uh, this is in full room lighting, incidentally. This is very, very bright indeed. We can see that there are striations in the spectrum. I'll just waft a little bit more magic smoke in front so we can see. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, there are striations in the spectrum and these lines are separated by about 10 or 12 nanometers or so if we look at it on the uh, spectrometer looks almost like the uh, output from a multi-line argon laser except far, you know, far more lines. Very, very nice. Um, again, this is uh, it's going to be some more research into academic papers to see what is driving this particular effect. Um, I'm hesitant to call it a frequency comb, although it is a bright comb without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I think the process is responsible for this might be soliton fission in the fiber itself. Beautiful. So I have the output of the supercontinuum laser directed at the face of my uh, Gentech pyroelectric sensor. On the oscilloscope, I'm only reading 600 microvolts. I was expecting really quite a bit more. If I run it through the calculator, we end up with an output energy of 4.47 microjoules. Uh, this is compared with our almost 21 microjoules in. Um, total uh, peak power is 2.35 kilowatts out. Um, again, you know, nearly 11 kilowatts in. So the, the system efficiency is around about 20%. Uh, so either we've got coupling losses to contend with or there are losses within the fiber. Uh, but either way, this is a really, really interesting experiment, it has to be said. So I have a setup here where the beam is emerging from the end of the bare fiber, being collimated, bounced off a mirror, 
and into a homemade Ulbricht sphere. And then on the other side, I have my Raspberry Pi spectrometer so that we can take a look at the um, spectrum of this thing. Um, this is the spectrum that we're viewing now is actually integrated over time. Um, and so it's very difficult to see the comb, although it's quite evident that there are some discrete peaks uh, within there. Um, this is to be expected that we'd get a short supercontinuum out of a short length of fiber. Because even short lengths of multimode cables seemed really quite promising, I bought 100 meters of 50 micron telecoms cable from a UK manufacturer. Uh, the reason why I went with a UK manufacturer this time is because, oddly, um, it's very difficult to get hold of quite long lengths of multimode. And I'm sort of fed up with buying cable off eBay to find that some performs very well and some performs not so well at all. Uh, what I did with this manufacturer was I purchased a 10 meter length to begin with uh, to see if it would exhibit any nonlinear effects and it did. So I took the plunge and bought 100 meters of the stuff. So I'm pumping 100 meters of 50 micron telecoms cable here with Kamar in one. I have a collimator lens mounted on the end there and our collimated beam is being reflected off a diffraction grating and onto the target. I'm just going to stop down the camera real quick because this will be very, very bright and will saturate the camera. But once I remove the attenuators from the beam path, we'll see an absolutely spectacular, brilliant comb up here. So this is still super continuum without a doubt, but we've got these very, very discrete peaks all the way through. These are separated by about maybe 10 or 12 nanometers or so. Absolutely fascinating. Really, really beautiful to look at. And the speckle is absolutely remarkable. We can see on this partial spectrum here, a comb-like structure. And the peaks are, as I've said before, roughly spaced about 12, 13 nanometers apart or so. Um, a really, really fascinating phenomenon, it has to be said. If anybody's got any explanation for this, I mean, really knows the answer for this, uh, do leave it in the comments down below. Uh, I think I've said previously in this video that my suspicion here is soliton fission or some, some process that's related at least. In this close-up image of the dispersed spectrum from 100 meters of telecoms cable, we can clearly make out the comb-like structure uh, running all the way from the blue to the red. Uh, it's very, very prominent indeed. This is a close-up image of the uncollimated beam exiting from the end of the fiber here. And we can see that initially it's, it's very, very narrow diameter indeed. And it starts to spread out, although nowhere near as much as we might expect. This is a picture of the same fiber from a different angle. And we can see the main white core of the beam and then some diffuse uh, scattered pump light, it appears to be around the main core itself. It's actually quite useful to be able to visualize the beam in this fashion. And here's an image of the same fiber with a collimator mounted on the end. And you'll note that we can get a very, very needle thin beam out of this. It's, it's really impressive to see, it has to be said. So let's have some gratuitous smoke shots. As you can see, the beam quality is absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely beautiful. What a sight to see. I thought I'd take a few long exposure photographs to really illustrate how um, beautiful this comb-like structure is in the resulting spectrum from 100 meters of multimode. Um, very, very nice indeed. You can clearly see the lines there. Uh, this image has to be my all-time favorite. It kind of reminds me of the image off of the Pink Floyd album cover. Um, very, very nice indeed. And just to round off, here's a final image with the light being dispersed by a diffraction grating. Um, really, really beautiful sight to see, it has to be said. Thanks for watching this episode of Leslie's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below, and I'll see you guys next time.